Good afternoon, Malakanyang Press Corps. Let's now have uh, Presidential Spokesperson Harry Roque. Good morning, um, Philippines, and good morning to the ladies and gentlemen of the Malakanyang Press Corps. Let me begin with our Monday good news. Um, the Duterte administration is indeed doing its best to provide support and assistance to Filipino beneficiaries through proper and immediate implementation of land distribution under its continu continuing agrarian reform program. With this, we are pleased to announce that the Department of Agrarian Reform has distributed 47 certificates of land ownership awards to 49 agrarian reform beneficiaries in four municipalities in the province of Rizal. These are the municipalities of Tanay, Murong, Baras, and Antipolo. This is to inform that um, four local government units have become recipients of the Department of Finance Climate Change Adaptation Projects. They are Lanuza, Surigao del Sur with 39 million, Del Carmen, Surigao del Norte with 80.7 million, San Francisco, Camotes Island, Cebu with 33.89 million, and Gerona Tarlac with 38.1 million. The DOF, if you will recall, has set up the People's Survival Fund to aid vulnerable communities to prepare for the adverse effects of climate change. The PSF has a program annual fund of 1 billion pesos in the National Treasury, which is on top of the annual appropri appropriations allocated to LGUs for programs and projects related to climate change. These four projects will have counterpart financing on the part of the LGUs, to improve the scale of the projects and promote proper disbursement of provided funds. Now, we also have good news in the fight against impunity, particularly against media killings. This morning, we're pleased to announce a breakthrough in the killing of broadcaster Christopher Luzada. A witness has personally identified the gunman who shot Chris Luzada and the um, Presidential tax Task Force on Media Killings will initiate the filing of appropriate charges against a suspect who happens to work for the family of Bislig City Mayor Librado Navarro. Undersecretary Joel C. Egko, Executive Director of the Presidential Task Force on Media Security, spearheaded the investigation and follow-up on the case, and he's here this morning to assist the witness. Ladies and gentlemen of the Malacanang Press Corps, Undersecretary Egko. Thank you very much, Secretary, uh, Secretary Roque. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the, the photo uh, here shows uh, the victim, Christopher Lozada. He was killed last October 24 uh, while he was driving home along with uh, his living partner, Hanifet Toiko in his own barangay in uh, the city of Bislig, Sarigao del Sur. Lozada died on the spot while Toiko sustained gunshot wounds and was rushed to the Andres Soriano Hospital for treatment. Next slide, please. On October 25, 2017, the PT Foams requested uh, then Director Augusto Marquez of uh, the DIDM and Task Force USIG uh, Executive Director uh, Superintendent Edgar Collantes to take immediate uh, action and conduct an investigation on the incident. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. On October 27, we proceeded to uh, Butuan City to conduct a case conference on the case of Mr. Lozada. The conference was presided by then Chief Superintendent Rolando Felix uh, the uh, regional director of Region 13. And we, it was also attended by the SITG, Lozada, ito yung special uh, task force po ng PNP, headed by Senior Superintendent Romualdo Baiting. There was also the CIDG chief, uh, Superintendent Cesar Padayos, and other PNP units working for the quick resolution of the case. Here are uh, some of the fo photos during the visit. Next slide, please. Part of our visit uh, was to attend the wake of Mr. Lozada and to personally see the site where, where uh, the killing took place. Next slide, please. Also, during the same visit, I was able to uh, get in touch with Hanifei Toiko, the, uh, who survived the attack. 
Next slide, please. <clears throat> on 6 November 2017, the PT firms wrote another letter to uh, Director Augusto Marquez reiterating the request for the investigation to be conducted by the CIDG upon the request of Mr. Lozada's family, considering the alleged involvement of local officials in the area. On 7 November 2017, the PT firms coordinated the implementation of two search warrants to the conduct of search and seizure operations by a team of PNP personnel led by uh, Superintendent Cesar Padayos of the CIDG at the residences of Felix Berto Villosino Jr. and, remember the name, Rolly Mahilum, who were named by sources as suspects in the shooting incident. I personally did the uh, follow-up and uh, personally uh, supervised the, the serving of the search warrants. After serving the search warrants, after one day, curiously, Superintendent Padaios was relieved from his post and uh, he was transferred since then to the Cordillera Administrative Region Police Office. Next slide. So these are the subject vehicles. We have uh, uh, on the left and the upper right the uh, Toyota Vios used by the victim, victims actually. So ito yung back portion. Take note that uh, the, the rear bumper was missing, is missing, dahil binangga po yan allegedly nung van. So ito yung front. And uh, during uh, Colonel Padayos uh, and the PNP officers Wa serving of the warrants, pinakunan po natin literato yung <coughs> subject gray van. Uh, this was first suspected to be at the house of uh, Rolly Mahilum, who was supposedly a driver of the uh, uh, local government official there. But during the search warrant, the, the van went missing, and they were able to trace the said van in the garage of the city hall. Next slide, please. On 10 November, upon receipt of the letter sent by PT Forms, the DIDM, through Chief Superintendent Eric Reyes, directed the CIDG to take appropriate action and likewise directed the Regional Director of the PNPPRO 13 to submit a report on the latest updates on the matter. 29 November, PT Forms received a report from superint uh, Senior Superintendent, Superintendent Francisco Dungo Jr., OIC of uh, the PNPPPO, Surigao del Sur. Ito po yung mga sinabi sa atin that uh, first, the initial investigation revealed that Lozada has a libel case filed by Bislig City Mayor Librado Navarro pending before Branch 29 of the RTC of Bislig City. Lozada had also been receiving threats through text messages from an unidentified sender. And number two of their findings, on 7 November also, a certain Felix Berto Villosino Jr., a.k.a. Junjun, was arrested for illegal possession of firearms and ammunition following a search conducted at this place, which yielded a fragmentation grenade, a 38 caliber revolver, and four live ammunition. He was subsequently charged with a criminal complaint for violation of RA 10591, or the Comprehensive Firearms and Ammunition Regulation Act, and RA 9516, illegal possession of explosives. Villosino is an alleged cohort of the gunmen in the shooting of Lozada and Toiko, and he remains under custody of the PNP CIDG 13 as of this report. On uh, 6 December, the PT Forms wrote a letter to uh, Chief Superintendent Noli Romana, the regional director of uh, Pro 13, requesting for updates and copies of pertinent documents on cases involving media worker killings under his jurisdiction which includes the case of Christopher Lozada. So on 7 of December, uh, we received a new report from uh, su Senior Superintendent Francisco Dungo, Jr., the OIC of the Philippine National Police Provincial Police Office of Surigao del Sur. Ito po yung mga sinabi. Number one, that a suspected getaway vehicle used by the gunmen was identified by the police a Toyota high ace van with plate number SFJ951 with engine number 2KD5159024, so and so. The said vehicle is allegedly owned by the city government of Bislig 
and was requested to be made available to the PNP for check and verification through the mayor. Uh, the request was made on 7 November 2017. As of the report, Mayor Navarro has not responded to the request. Number two item, another suspected cohort of the gun, gunmen had been identified, again, a certain Rolly Mahilum, remember the name. He was also charged with violation of RA 10591 and RA 9516. So pareho yung kinaso sa kanila. Mahilum remains at large. Next slide, please. 20 December, again, Senior Superintendent Francisco Dungo Jr. submitted a report to us, uh, reporting that, number one, that Hani Faith Toiko, the, sur the uh, survivor, the living partner, had already executed a sworn statement and that uh, it was subscribed before the uh, city prosecutor's office. And number two, on November 20, two witnesses executed sworn statements on the grave, Toyota Hayes van used in the killing of Lozada, which were subscribed again before the city prosecutor. Next slide, please, after this. <clears throat> Okay, on February 25, next slide. On February 25, 2018, while browsing through the pictures of Mr. Lozada on the laptop computer of one of uh, the victim staff, the witness who is now in our custody, the principal eyewitness in the, in the, in the case, came across a photo of this man who the witness identified without doubt as the man who shot Lozada. Okay. Next slide, please. That's the photo of the man. And this is Christopher Lozada, the victim. So, the man was later identified by uh, family and friends, by uh, local sources there, and, uh, and, and other officials in Bislig City as Rolly Mahilum. So the same Rolly Mahilum who has been the subject, uh, who has been uh, facing charges of illegal possession since last year. But remember that uh, last year, they have a name, but they don't have a photo, but uh, when, when our witness saw this photo, sinabi niya, siya talaga, pero hindi niya mapangalanan. It turned out that the photo is that of uh, Rolly Mahilum. So our next step is that we're going to file the appro appropriate charges against Rolly Mahilum. Uh, we cannot uh, 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 give you the other details about uh, our next steps because we don't want to telegraph uh, our punches to the other side. And um, rest assured that we are doing this because we are sincere, the government is sincere in running after anybody or anyone who maims, who threatens, who, and who even kills journalists, especially during the uh, uh, time of President Rodrigo Duterte. So that's all, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions. Thank you, if you have questions. <coughs> Ah, yeah. uh, merong, uh, ano daw, who is uh, Rolly Mahilum? Rolly Mahilum is, according to them, according to our uh, witnesses, our, our uh, uh, sources in Bitlig, is still the driver, the close aide of the family of the city mayor of Bitlig. So we, we, we do not claim that uh, uh, any of the family member is directly linked no, to, to the crime, but you know, it depends. After, depende dun siguro sa sasabihin na itong si Rolly Mahilum once we get him. Any questions, Thank MPC? You said ECO, na file, you, na file na ba yung case against uh, Rolly Mahilum? Uh, we're going to file it immediately. Ah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Yusek ECO. Again, the position of the Duterte administration is that we value freedom of the press, we value the right to life, and that is why the office of um, USEC EGCO was created precisely to deal with the issue of impunity, uh, to prevent and um, to safeguard the lives of media personnel. 
Now I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Madam Ambassador of Australia. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. Questions, please. Be nice because the Australian ambassador is around. <laughs> so please. MPC question. For once, be nice. <laughs> Go ahead. Laila, you have a question? Good morning, sir. Sir, we objected to the statements of the Human Commissioner, High Commissioner for Human Rights, that the President should undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Is this going to affect our willingness or our openness to a rapporteur to conduct a fact-finding inquiry in the country? I think we have made our position clear on the matter of special rapporteurs. Uh, we are welcome. We welcome special rapporteurs provided they be impartial, neutral, and willing to investigate rather than. Um, those already having conclusions and wanting to justify them through an investigation. Um, I think the matter of the statement made by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights is being treated very seriously. It's being uh, treated as a diplomatic affront. It's wholly unacceptable. And until now, I'm restraining myself from using similar language. I can assure the good High Commissioner I'm better at using names. Yes, please. To be clear, we won't be using his comments as an excuse or a reason to stop a rapporteur from coming to the country. Well, the comments are wholly unacceptable. Um, and um, I would say that um, for now, there are already communications ongoing between no less than the UN Secretary General and um, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. No? Let's just say that that kind of a comment is not conducive to having further investigations in the Philippines by the, any special rapporteur. But as I said, the communications are ongoing. <coughs> Let's see what happens. So are you saying there's a possibility that we might uh, stop an investigation because of the, the comments? No, I'm just saying that it did not come at a, an appropriate time. OK, okay. Fo follow up, Pia Gutierrez. Sir, on the palace's objection to the remarks of uh, the UN official, um, why is language suddenly important for an administration that tolerates the remarks of President Duterte? Um, practically, uh, basically, it's yung language or remarks of President Duterte is, kung tutusin natin, is more controversial, like his remarks on shooting NPA fighters in. The genitals, People, because the in the heads. UN system, sovereignty is important and sovereign heads are still respected. But President Duterte has called former U.S. President Barack Obama as a son of a bitch. That's a former president, not a sitting president. But his remarks, sir, was made when President, Duterte, uh, Pre uh, president Obama was still sitting as U.S. That's president. That's correct, General. but he was not U.N. Secretary General. He is serving as U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is still an international organization composed of states, and heads of states are not accorded that kind of a language. So, sir, what is the difference between a UN official and a president of a country, sir? Well, because the UN office officials no, should, as a matter of course, respect sitting heads of states, because after all, the UN is composed, as an international organization, is composed of sovereign states, and the sovereign states, of course, are represented by their respective um, leaders. No? And of course, I've said already over the weekend that uh, we especially take uh, um, offense because the uh, president is a democratically elected uh, leader of this nation. So basically, sir, you're saying that we excuse the language of the president but not a uh, No, UN there's a official. word of a difference between a UN official using crude language against a sitting head of state and the president using any kind of language that he wants on a private individual, especially in this instance when the person using the crude language is himself without a democratic mandate. Thank you, sir. Okay, Ace Romero. Secretary, how about uh, <coughs> the president's uh, remarks over the weekend that he would throw the human rights experts to crocodiles? Is, just, is, is it serious or it's just one of those uh, controversial statements. It's an appropriate response to a remark that, as I said, should not have been made by a sitting UN Human High Commissioner for Human Rights. Appropriate remark. It's an appropriate response. But uh, will he do it? I, I mean, if I don't he think he's in a position to do it. Come on. <laughs> okay. 
They're so, not even being allowed in to investigate. There will be no occasion to push them to the crocodiles. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Secretary. Follow-up question? Other issue? MPC? Other issue? Well, you're quiet all of a sudden. You're being nice because we have visitors. Raymond, Thank you okay. very much. Raymond Tinasa. Raymond. <laughs> I said, good noon. Sir, just a reaction to the, well, the position of the Chief Justice Sereno early this morning not to resign and not to bow down to the calls of her resignation. Gosh, that's up to her. We've and left the decision to her. No one can force her to resign if she doesn't want. <coughs> However, um, I think the... Um, sentiment even of the lower court judges have been made known and um, we can only hope that the um, chief justice will take all these sentiments into consideration but the decision to remind is hers to be made so but uh, precisely uh, aren't you concerned that there will be an effect to the delivery of justice now that the philippine uh, judges association aired their uh, grievance or their position calling her to resign that's for her to consider. The Supreme Court is a collegial body, and there's 14 other justices. Thank you, sir. Follow-up question? Other issue of follow-up? Pia. Sir, this morning, the employees of the Supreme Court has asked uh, CJ Sereno to resign. So what, what does the palace think um, of that, sir? And uh, what do you think? Um, her unpopularity among her peers, uh, does it have anything to say about her capacity to lead the judiciary? Well, as I said earlier, you know, the decision to resign is one to be made by the Chief Justice alone. And um, at most, what we are going to say is that she, we hope that she takes into consideration the sentiments of everyone, all the stakeholders. Um, so far, her colleagues have asked her to go on indefinite leave, and the lower court judges have asked her to resign. Um, we can only ask her to consider all these um, calls from various stakeholders within the courts itself. Questions? Sheila? Follow up, Ina? Sheila. Hi, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. Sir, the consultative committee tasked to review the 1987 Constitution has recommended to regulate the political dynasties instead of banning them. Does, does, uh, does the palace support this and why? Well, I think the, the sentiment of the president itself is he doesn't consider political dynasties as bad per se. Um, he has said that sometimes they can lead to good results, but we respect and defer to the uh, wisdom of the consultative um, commission, and we hope that Congress will consider this particular recommendation. MPC? Ina, other topic. Hi, sir. Sir, may update na po pa dun sa decision sa Boracay. Is it true that the um, option to close down the island um, is no longer being considered? Well, um, there was supposed to be a meeting today, but I understand they had it earlier last Friday because uh, Secretary Simatu was uh, not available today. And I understand there will be another meeting this week with... Um, architect June Palafox. So no decision has been made by at least the three secretaries of justice because there's a second round of meeting to be held this week. Okay. MPC, questions? Ian, follow up? Other issue? What did you do again to Joseph Morong? <laughs> follow up muna tayo with, follow up muna. Celerina, thank you. Good afternoon, sir. As uh, so regarding the president's statement before that um, he will declare a state of calamity in Boracay, meron na bang any proclamation or what? No proclamation yet. When can we expect that proclamation? I can't say, but I will inform you if one has been issued. Okay, thank you, Ian. I understand that no less than the municipality of Malay is also considering the possibility of a similar declaration of a state of calamity because under the law, the local government unit or the national government can declare such a um, declaration. Okay. Secretary, yeah. good afternoon. Uh, napirmahan po ni Presidente yung uh, isang law granting subpoena powers to PNP. Uh, may mga other sectors na nagsasabi baka daw ma-abuse ito ng PNP. Well, like all laws, it can be abused, but um, 
the objective of the law is to bolster the um, investigation capability of the uh, PNP. And I highlight to add two points. Number one, not all policemen can issue subpoenas, only the chief PNP, the CID chief, and the deputy. Number two, um, breach of the subpoena will not give the police any authority to detain anyone. It will only be a cause of action for indirect contempt. They have to go to court, file a petition for indirect contempt before they can apprehend anyone for failure to comply with the subpoena. So under this circumstance, I think the possibility of abuse will be minimized, if not remote. Questions? Another topic, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, I appoint yung kasi ni Ma'am Hanilet sa, uh, sa HADC, you know? Uh, does, it, does that mean, sir, na yung ibang natanggal pwede rin maibalik and uh, may policy na ba tayo tungkol doon? Appointment, of course, is a purely executive prerogative, no? So no one can question the inherent power of the uh, president to appoint anyone. Sir, another topic, sir. Uh, MRT, sir, do you have an update regarding MRT, sir? None yet, but I think I will release some documents this week as I promised. Okay, MPC, questions, one. Hi, sir. Uh, Joanna Valera ng Inquirer.net. Ako pa yung nagtetext sa inyo. Uh, yes. Sir, follow up ko lang po doon sa subpoena powers. Uh, since there are uh, thousands of uh, cases under investigation ng uh, PNP, no, how do you think the subpoena powers can affect the, uh, this uh, number? Po? Well, I would, I suppose because of the, uh, the fact that there are limited signatories to the uh, subpoenas, no, that it will be reserved for the extreme circumstance where individuals have absolutely refused to cooperate in an ongoing police investigation. The fact that only three people can sign it, of course, would mean that it would not be resorted as often as uh, uh, people might expect. No? So it, it's actually, it, it bolsters the power of the, the police to conduct investigations properly, but it's not going to be a common thing. No? Okay. So how, uh, how do you define, sir, your extreme power, your extreme ins instances? Well, because it has to go up to the chain of command if you want a subpoena, no? so you would have to make a request. No? So I'm sure the police will reserve the exercise of the subpoena powers when there's really an absolute unwillingness to cooperate with an ongoing investigation. Okay, no more? MPC? Pia? Sir, what does the President say on uh, about the efforts to encourage Sapbongo to run for senator? Well, um, I understand uh, the president has broached it to um, um, SAPGO, um, and it's something that they are discussing between the two of them. Ace? Nabanggit kasi ni Secretary Go sa huling ambush interview, it will be up to the president. So the president will give him the go signal whether to run. May say si president. I believe so. The position of um, Sapgo is he will heed whatever the president wishes him to do. So it will be dependent on the president? Yes, parang. definitely. So kahit gusto niya kung ayaw ni presidente. He has said that personally he would not run, but if the president asks him to, he will. Okay. Prince? Last question on Taike Prince. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hi, sir. Good morning, sir. Sir, um, Se Senator Laila Delima took offense at your remark against um, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. She said that uh, what you are boasting is just a shadow of um, what remains of the Philippine democracy. I don't know what she's talking about. She won in the same election where the president won. So she's saying that uh, she shouldn't have sat as a senator. My point was, people who have a democratic mandate deserve respect, especially from those without a mandate. She also likened you to a common house fly, sir, and even described you as a fake human rights lawyer, sir. Again, enjoy the rest of your life in jail. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, MPC, no more questions? Okay, thank you, Presidential Spokesperson Harry Roque. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you to our guest and Malakanyang Press Corps. Back to our main studio sa Radio Pilipinas and PTV. Ano yun? Ano yun? <laughs>